it's Kristen, and you are listening to the newest episode of Conversations on the Rocks, the podcast that's as random as the tumbleweed that goes through my head on a hot summer day. And I have an author with me today. It's my first author. <laughs> And I am actually an author, kind of. I did a compila compilation, so I am published. I can walk around and say, I am a published author. But Lisa Girardi, who is my guest today, is a bona fide author. Like, she's been writing her book now, um, Chasing Normal, for – it's been a hot minute, hasn't it? It's been about a uh, year. Yeah. It is, yeah, well, it's been like a decade since I first started it. Um, and then, you know, it's it's a memoir. So I'd kind of be all gung ho. And then I'd like, I don't want to think about this, you know, because my childhood wasn't like a downy fabric softener commercial or anything. It was, you know, different. So, it's hard. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> I think I, I, we were chat, chatting earlier today, and I told you I've read half of it already, um, which I still owe you a review for Amazon so I can be a published author again. Um, yes. But it's an intense topic. Do you want to talk about mm -hmm. it a little bit? I mean, sure. I, I don't I know. I mean, I agree that it's in the book, but not... Right. You know. <laughs> right. It's in the book. I was... Um, so it's been, it's always been my normal. So I can talk about this very easily, and other people are like... I almost titled the memoir Making People Cringe because, you know, like I'll be in a situation like a book club and people are like, oh, I remember when my grandma made cookies. And I'm there like, I remember when I went to my grandma to get help because my step uncle was molesting me and she told me we don't talk about that. You know, and everybody's like, and to me, it's like, eh, you know, it is what it is. But people hear that and they're like, oh, wow. <laughs> well, well, it's a very... Um... <sighs> It's a hard topic that is very real, but people don't want to talk about it because it makes them uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it is a conversation that needs to happen a little bit more often because you and I are the same. We're both Gen Xers, so we're in the same, you know, mm -hmm. I don't call it age anymore. We're at, we're at the same game level. And mm -hmm. you're right. Back then, not, you know, thank God nothing like that ever happened to me. Good. Um, yeah, how, good. yeah, exactly. But... You know, it's it, it that was the general. Oh, we don't talk about that. And Definitely, it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it still happens. These situations still happen. Um, however, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that as a society, you know, we take it a lot more seriously now. Whether mm -hmm. it's you know assault of a child or assault in general, um, it's you know it, not so much of the it's his word, their word against your word, because there's a lot mm -hmm. of that. It's you know, like the, the thing that the big viral thing a couple of months ago, remember with the bear or like just last month? Yes. Would yes, you rather yes. be alone with a man or a bear? And all these women were listing off the things that they'd rather be yeah. alone with a bear. <laughs> right, right. That's yeah. sad that we're still in that kind of a situation. As yeah. A society. Yeah. So what made you, you said you've been doing it for about 10 years. You've lived with it your entire life. So mm -hmm. over 50 years. And what was, what, what made you finally go, I'm putting this down on paper. I am going to publish this. I am going to put out my memoir. You know, um, a couple of things. Getting involved with the Nonfiction Authors Association was very motivating. And I watched, I forget the name of the movie, but I watched a movie on TV where she was writing about being abused. And um, she was always holding off on it. And then someone told her, write like no one is going to read it. And so then I started doing that. Do you know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about, but I can't remember the name. It was mm -mm. That, that little piece that you just said right there. Mm -hmm. Right? Like no one's going to read it. So, and that was always my, you know, fear. And then to be honest, my mother died in 2019 and I felt more liberated to write because she is, I, I don't know what planet she lived on during those years, but it certainly wasn't the same one I'm on because her recollection is very different. <laughs> Do you think, how was your relationship with your mom as an adult? Um, it had stages. So I, I had to kind of divide her into two people, then mom and now mom. She got better as I got older. And my stepdad, even though he was a bigot and, whatever was like the best man she brought into our life. 
<clears throat> and he told her, you know, stop hitting her, go easy on her. She's a good kid. So, <clears throat> sorry, my younger years. Chuck, 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 chuck. <clears throat> younger, like 20s, I was okay with her. You know, she'd still give me money, buy me things for my apartment. Um, but as I got older and as my son got older, I got angrier because I love my son so much. I couldn't understand how she did not do anything when I told her about sexual abuse. She did nothing. And, and how she could talk the way she talked to me and hit me and stuff, you know, like, so it got worse. And then I, I would just, I felt bad for her because as she got older, my brother had like, he was off the face of the earth. We didn't know where he was. So I was all she had. So, you know, my husband used to say, I don't understand why you still talk to her. And the thing was like guilt, I guess, like I'm all she has. You know, we don't have a very big family. That's says a lot <clears throat> about you. Mm -hmm. That says a lot. You're in, in your mom. She was she was single, right? She was mm -hmm. a single working mom for a, a lot of years. When was it that your stepdad came into the picture? Um, she met him when I was 13. OK, when I was in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. So as a single working mother, do you feel or do you think that she poo pooed it um, because she was having to rely on the perpetrators. Mm -hmm. And if definitely, she, and if she <laughs> were to, and I'm not justifying it, please don't mm -hmm. take that at all. And if she were to say something, then I'm going to be kind of crass here. Then the gravy train, the help, the gravy train that she mm -hmm. had would be gone, mm -hmm. or it could turn around and then whatever abuse was was on her. And, mm -hmm. you know, which it's still just a shitty, shitty thing to do because oh, for sure. I will, there's only five people in the world that I would go to jail for. And three of those are my children. Mm -hmm. And it is, and you know, granted some days I feel like I need to go to jail because of them, but you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, that is as a mother and you know, this, you're a mom yourself. I mean, did you ever ask her why? <laughs> No, I, I never really talked much about it as an adult. Um, the one time, there was one time I saw her have like guilt or feelings about it. I, um, in my early 20s is when my GI system started really bugging me. And I, I was, I prepped and I was supposed to have a lower GI, which is a barium enema. Fun, fun time. This um, town so, needs an enema. Yeah. <laughs> That's my favorite so, line from Batman. <laughs> <laughs> so um, she took me to the, to the hospital to have this test, only they, they do not, at least 20 years ago, or when, no, this was 30 years ago. I'm lying to myself about my age. Um, they did not knock me out or anything. And I, they, they did not even get the thing there and I was hyperventilating and I jumped off the um the gurney or whatever it's not a gurney whatever the bench is they put you on and I went back to where my mom was waiting and I was hyperventilating and crying and she got mad at not herself really but she was like you know effing Norman the, my step uncle was Norman right. which is a terrible name Sorry to all the Normans out there, but that name just is <laughs> a terrible name. <laughs> Psycho is extra scary for me. You know, so she did like show some feelings about it, but she never really, I don't know. I don't know if, if she had the ability to be a better thinker and communicator. I don't know. I would imagine, you know, that in, I have to believe um, that in some way that the guilt she felt mm -hmm. had to carry over. I, I just mm -hmm. have to, in my mom heart, I have to, right. you know, she knew what it was that it wasn't right. So I have to hope and believe that, you know, she didn't talk about it. She avoided it. But at the same time, she maybe internally acknowledged the fact that what she did was really awful um, mm -hmm. or didn't prevent. Um, 
what was the most challenging part, do you think, about writing about this? Sharing, you know, it's it's weird, but like you said, we're Gen X. So my my arc, I guess, is, yeah. you know, the abuse happened and then I had horrible relationships and then I found Chris. So the horrible relationships, I, I internally slut shame myself. So I was like, wow, I was a big old slut, you know? <laughs> so that was tough. It was tough to be honest. And I'm not even including everything. Like this is my best version of honest about my dating life. Um, and, and I don't have shame over being sexually abused because I didn't do that. You know, right. Like that wasn't my fault, but right. then the you dating and the, you weren't yeah. wearing that little princess dress to try. I wasn't, I wasn't, I never understood why, uh, people didn't believe me or do anything. Cause this was in the seventies, right? It's not like we had the internet. How do I know what a, what male genitalia looks like? You know, I didn't have access to anything. So why wouldn't you believe a little kid? Because they didn't want to. They didn't want to have to do anything about it. That's right. That's going to get, that ish is going to get ugly. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've i known, unfortunately, I've known women and young ladies who've, had, who've dealt with sexual assault older. And even in the 21st century, there's still that, well, what were mm -hmm. you doing? What were, what were you wearing? Did you, were mm -hmm. you drinking? I'm like, I remember telling my girls, like, I don't care if you are standing buck ass naked right. holding a 12 pack of beer and it, no is no and that right. is it and i will come after somebody if that is mm -hmm. the case but a lot of times too it doesn't these guys get away with it or these people mm -hmm. get away with it because our our judicial system is set up so that the victim is victimized twice Right. So I have an example. Of that. Please. <laughs> um, so when I lived in Ohio, I was on a grand jury, which was interesting. I'm a nosy person. I actually like jury duty, but they saved the sexual assaults for after lunch. So it was always, you know, troubling. And this young woman came in, you know, um, uh, an acquaintance had raped her, had kidnapped her and raped her, actually had kept her against her will. And usually the perpetrator doesn't come in to give testimony, but he did. He did. And um, he was just all handsome and denying everything and like, oh, it was consensual because DNA evidence doesn't nail them. They can just say it was consensual. Right. So what really angered me about the situation is the, the three women sitting across the table from me on the jury who were like, well, you said she was a dancer. <sighs> yeah because she was a dancer, she deserved to be kidnapped and taken, like he offered her a ride home and he, he did not let her get out of the car, took her to his house, tied her up the whole nine yards. And no, but she's a dancer. Right, so that makes it okay. Yeah. 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 I don't know what happened with that case, but I don't, I wouldn't be surprised if he was not found not guilty. Oh, probably because she was a dancer. Well, that's mm -hmm. another thing, to, and this is totally off subject, but kind of on topic, which mm -hmm. is the whole why um, sex workers, it, mm -hmm. the whole sex work thing just needs to be legalized. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to take away, if we can start getting rid of the stigma and the connotation behind some of these things, you know, right. these, these people, I won't just say lady, you know, young ladies or girls or whatever, they're just trying to make a living. They should be safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They should be safe, but that's the reason why a lot of them, unfortunately, then run, run down the addict uh, path mm -hmm. that goes with it. Um, what about your son and what about Chris? How did oh. they, I mean, how did, talk a little bit about how, uh, because again, very sensitive topic, right? Not only is mm -hmm. it a sensitive topic, but now it's my mom and my wife and having oh, yeah. to go through that. <laughs> how, did, how, did, how did that work? pan not pan out but you know how well how that? since that happened to me and i've always been pretty open with my son at whatever age like whatever level he could handle you know 
Um, I have asked him his entire life if anybody has touched him inappropriately. He's 27. I still do because he once told his friend, like, gosh, if something happened to me, I wouldn't tell my mom because she'd be in jail. So I ask him all the time, now, are you sure? Are you just not telling me because, you know, I'll go kill him? Or you know? So he he's known his whole life. Um, I did send them the first draft of my book. And Chris, uh, op- he doesn't want to read it because of the, the dating stuff. And there's a, you know, boyfriend in college that was abusive to me, but we had wonderful sex. So, you know, that's kind of, he doesn't want to hear it. <laughs> yes. Um, and my son started reading it and he texted me, he said, mom, I'm sure this is going to be a page turner, but, um, you're my mom. So it's hard for them to read. But how were they through the process? I'm sure they were supportive, right? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And yeah, you, Chris, were, you, were you able to um, work through some of those things with them? I mean, it, I mean, you're a very open and honest person. I can't see mm-hmm. ever that you would have not been open and honest and transparent with them about the situation. So really, it's no surprise except for the fact that you're just writing a you know 250 yeah. page, 300 page book. Right, right. Yeah, no, I've always been open with them and um, medical things like Chris has seen me have a meltdown um, in the gynecologist's office because she wanted to do a uterine biopsy and I somebody they attempted that on me before and I said, no, you have to knock me out. (laughs) Any anything deep orifice like that. I have to be unconscious because it's weird. There's a book, I think the body remembers or something like that. I have it over there. But um, even though I go in to these situations, knowing that they are not there to hurt me, my body just goes nuts. If we're, if we're doing anything rectal or beyond the cervix, you know, it's almost like muscle memory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So he's seen me do that. Like, and then they had to schedule a DNC because I was like, no, I need to. <laughs> you are not doing that. You, I mean, we've known each other for a long time. We kind of grew up in the blogging world together. And your sense of humor has always been a key piece of, I mean, you're funny. You're funny as shit. <laughs> shit can be unfunny too, though. It sure can, but yours yeah. is funny. <laughs> um, do you, th- and you know, it is very true that, you know, humor sometimes hides our trauma, right? That's how we do oh, for things. Sure. Um, do you think, and I, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty punny and, you know, witty kind mm-hmm. of person too. I'm sure. not, I don't take a lot of things very seriously. Mm-hmm. And I know sometimes that that's, you know, it's easier to deal with these things with humor. Do you think that that, let me ask you this way. Were you the little comic when you were young? Mm-hmm. Oh, like, yeah. Do you think it's always, though, been kind of a way to um, um, not have to deal with the demons face on? It's easier to deal with them. Definitely. When I first realized I was funny was eighth grade. I had moved to a new school before my mom met John. And uh, my old school was very tough, like, hood school but the boundaries changed so i got to go to this new school and it's all these people i don't know and um i just started cracking jokes and then all of a sudden i you know was in with the preps and so i thought wow that's you know it's good that i'm funny and then the first time john met me he had us to that we lived in the same apartment building as he did and uh he had us to his apartment for dinner and i was just you know my mom had dated rod for seven years who as she got older, didn't exist. She's like, I never dated when Lisa was little. I'm like, okay. Um, and he was horrible. So I, you know, I'm like, oh, here we go again. Janet's picked out another man. Let me, you know, get rid of him. And I was just tearing into him because I can really hurt people with my words. It's it's both a, a, a good thing and a bad thing sometimes. <laughs> um, no, and I, he- I, I understand that. <laughs> And he just, he laughed and laughed and he goes, you got the, he was much older than my mom. He's like, you got the gift of gab, kid. He says, you remind me of Joan Rivers. And I was like, who's Joan Rivers? You don't know, he's Italian too. You don't know who Joan Rivers is? And he got me the album for Christmas, one of her album. Young People, the vinyl, the vinyl before. Yeah. So yeah, he got me into basically, and then I started doing comedy, you know, uh, like, Eight years later, I would say. 
when did you finally break out? Like, break when out? Did you, like break out from your mom? <gasps> How old were you? Like when oh, did you um, to go out on your own? Did you go to college? Did you go to college traditional? I did. So my mom made me. <laughs> I had the the boyfriend that nobody liked. Um, I didn't want to go away to college. I'm not a partier. I'm I like to read. Um, but I got into Florida State, and um, she made me made me go. She's like, no, you're going. I'm like, but I could go to community college and it's right here. And they're like, no. And plus my stepdad was so much older. He'd raised his kids. So he wanted me out. So 17, I drove nine hours to Florida State in my Chevy Chevette. But then I, I really hated it. So the next year I moved back in with them and went to school locally. But then when I was 22, my stepdad was like starting, he's like taking me to look at apartments that are in terrible places, but you know, that I could afford. So I moved in um, with the man who is now my ex-husband because they wanted me out and you know, oh, he had room. So I just moved in with him. And I tell my son now, you know, you wouldn't be here if my parents were nicer. <laughs> Cause he's from your first marriage. Oh yeah. 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 But, but he, he gets along with Chris better, I would say. But isn't it kind of interesting though, had you not had a different, um, approach or some, you know, just a different mindset, having lived through that, how mm -hmm. easy it would have been for you to fall into the same trap that your mom did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did repeat some of her behavior. I mean, I, you know, have a divorce. I, I did hit Sergio when he was younger. Um, I think when he was about eight is when I, I met Chris and I was just like, I need to learn how to be a parent. I can't, you know, I can't hit him. That's just not helpful. And he's so smart, even as a little kid, that helped me to, to be able to talk to him instead of lose my shit. Right. So um, I did have a therapist when I was going through my divorce, I went to a therapist. And like I said, I never thought really much about how old I was when I was abused. I was two. Um, and she said, how that she said, that's profound abuse. How are you not on a corner right now? And I just said, because I don't want to be. I don't know. It's a it's a good testament to your strong will, because mm -hmm. I, I can totally, I mean, it, when I went through my divorce, I did a lot of self work, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have to, and I didn't necessarily want to go to a therapist. So I said, Okay, well, I'm gonna read. And boy, did I learn a lot about myself and my behaviors, like, you know, I was, I was, you know, we were both latchkey kids, but I was the latchkey mm -hmm. kid. And, you know, I couldn't understand why I kept chasing after unemotionally, um, emotionally unavailable people. And then I, mm -hmm. and that I was an emotionally unavailable person, but why am I an emotionally unavailable person? Because I got no emotion at home kind of thing. And it's like, once you mm -hmm. start going through this and you start, and then you get mm -hmm. to the point that until you work on yourself, you're going to keep chasing that. You're going to keep chasing, whether it's mommy issues or daddy issues, you're mm -hmm. going to keep trying to, for me, it was, you know, my stepdad, I could never, I was never good enough uh, for him. Mm -hmm. and, if, and, and if I was, he, he didn't let me know. It was always, you could do this better. You could do that better. So I was always in my entire life and, you know, in, in my dating life, in my marriage life, in my post-marriage life, I was always trying to prove that I was worthy and because I was trying to prove it to the wrong people. So, I mean, we, mm -hmm. we're destined to repeat these patterns until mm -hmm. we finally go, okay, until we can name it, right? Once you can right. name it, then you're like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, yeah. now let's get our ish together and let's let's start from here. Um, right. I, I came into that naming thing um, a couple of years ago. La, what year is this? Is 2024. So my youngest moved out to uh, of the house like so the beginning of mm -hmm. empty nesting and i was so it was i didn't put a name to it but i was like a mm -hmm. couple of months later i was like what is wrong with me like i'm just like mm -hmm. Meh. like i don't want to mm -hmm. do this i don't want to do that and then it finally clicked on me that i was depressed yeah I, that, oh, yeah that huge piece of my life of being mm -hmm. an active mother an active mm -hmm. parent was 
done. Uh-huh. And once uh-huh. I put once I put the once I was able to label it, then I was able to fix it. Yeah. No, that does help. Um with relationships, a therapist I saw um before I even married my ex husband, um, which I shouldn't have, but said that I create chaos. Because if you're used to chaos, if you grow up with chaos, you, you recreate it. Mm-hmm. So in relationships, I was either the abused or the abuser, not physical. I've never physically abused a man, but just, you know, cheated, left, whatever, you know, just hurt them right. somehow. So I think when I met Chris, a couple of things had happened. I, I had to talk to myself in my head and I said, you do not have to to date men who need to be fixed and you can just date someone who's nice to you. Like you can allow, (laughs) you can allow that to happen, you know? So, um, and, and you don't have to try to destroy it. Cause I, I did, I remember one time when we were engaged, like being real mean to him and he was just, and then I caught myself. I'm like, what am I doing? I've had to have the conversation several times with people and I did the same thing until I did the work on myself, Mm -hmm. which is the whole, um, spark the butterflies. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. I'm like, I've had, I'm like, that's not good. Society Mm -hmm. has, has lied to us and told us that if you don't feel sparks and butterflies, it's not the right person. And I'm like, Oh no, that's your body telling you run. That's your fight or flight coming in. And that's that. Yeah. Point. And safe feels boring because you don't feel that. Uh huh. Uh huh. No, for sure. For sure. The relationship I had in high school, my senior year, wasted my whole senior year on this, this guy was like that butterflies and excitement. And I lost a bunch of weight because I wasn't eating. And, you know, it was, yeah. And it was your adrenaline. Yeah. How's the process? We're going to segue a little bit because we're probably got about another 10 minutes left. But uh, let's talk about the process, the fun part of writing a book. So uh, I I mean, I've never actually written my own book. Um, I had, you know, when I contributed, it was somebody else taking care of it. What happens now? Okay, so the book comes out in November after the election. She made sure to point out after the election. Oh, yeah. With nothing to Um, do with fighting. (laughs) So the book. So you are. Is it done? Has it gone to print yet? I know you had mentioned to me that you um, had some more edits, editing to do. I am. Yeah, I'm doing one more revision because I I sent it um, a couple months ago to a developmental editor, and she, you know, really said no. You need to do a lot here. <laughs> so so I'm I'm doing what she said, and um, I I will probably it'll probably be completed completed by September 15th. And then that will give me a couple of months to do things like this and, you know, all those other things promote, I guess. I'm not good at that, but <laughs> I have to try. Um, no, it's been fun. And then, so then the book goes on sale. You know, it's not like the, it's not like they, uh, they used to make it seem in the movies and TV shows. You're not going on like, you know, a 50 city tour. <laughs> No, no. I, I very much want Jenna Bush Hagar to interview me on the Today Show, but you know, I don't. I don't think I just can call her and say, "Hey, Why not? you know, bestie, I'm stopping in." Hey, <laughs> I might send her a book. Happen to be in the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, well, you should. And then, are you going to do anything else? Is this your one and done? Do you think this will motivate you to do other published pieces? Oh, I am working on a journal with uh, with prompts, and it's called Say Nope to Normal. Um, so I, I am going to get that out sometime after the book. Um, I want to speak more because I, I know, you know, this kind of thing happens to a lot of people out there. Um, so I, I would like to go speak. I, I find it easy to speak about my abuse. I I, I tend, you know, like I said, I tend to make other people uncomfortable when I talk about it, but I can talk about it. Um, I, I don't know. I, I see myself trying to help younger women and girls more to get through that. To and move I think on. it will. Yeah. And I think yeah. it will. I mean, it kind of goes back to, you know, it's a catastrophic thing to have happen, right? Mm hmm. 
and it can very easily define the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And there has to be a choice made. Um, because if you don't make a choice and I'm not saying get over it, right. Cause you, do you ever really right. get over yeah. it? Yeah. However, <laughs> you, can, you can make the choice to whether or not how much it's going to define you and your life and your future. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's something I'd never wish on anyone, but how you choose to move on with your life is says a lot about you. Um, and a lot about the family and friends that surround you and support you through this. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's fantastic. I'm glad you did it. I'm glad I've known you. Um, so, it, you know, the name of the book is Chasing Normal. Mm -hmm. Just as we close out in your eight-year-old, nine-year-old self, what mm -hmm. was normal to you? Um, I, I had friends who, okay, so Jenny was my best friend in eighth grade. Her mom stayed home and she was nice she didn't scream at us or anything uh jenny was in girl scouts and she took dance classes and um her mom cooked like we, we were big on tv dinners and drive through you know and and her dad did not sexually abuse her so it was just like that like that was normal and so in high school and later when I dated people that I was not compatible with, part of it was, oh, his family is normal. And then I could be in that family, you know? And now, you know, it, when did your definition of normal change? And then what does normal look like to you now? Oh, I'm never going to be normal because I, you know, I, I say whatever comes to my mind. I'm like Sophia on the Golden Girls. That's who I identify with. Um, yeah, normal is anything. But that is your normal. Yeah, my normal is that I'm a little nutty. Is <laughs> And I didn't realize. I mean, I think it took me a long time. Is when I was younger, I thought, yeah, I was sexually abused, but I'm fine. No, I wasn't fine, you know just burying it. Yeah. It's just like the, the gift that keeps on giving until you unwrap it. Mm hmm. That's a good thing. Yeah. That's a good thought. I need that printed. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, thank you so much for taking time you. to tell your story. Can't wait. I'm going to finish the book and I'm going to get you your quote, your review. You. Um, I promise because uh, I know it's important. And see, that's why I have to have a deadline because if you don't give me a deadline, I'll be like, Doop. Do, do, do. And now I know my deadline's do coming because you said I need to have it by September. And I'm like, okay, I got it. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I do want to uh, put something inside the book too. have a page of quotes. So oh, nice. Do that. Yeah, very nice. Little mm -hmm. and I like the journal, you know, journaling is good. And you know, it helps us writing things down helps us process a lot of you mm -hmm. know, just getting yeah. it out. Sometimes, you know, just putting it on paper is the first step to really getting things out. The catharticism mm -hmm. of it is really good. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. well, the best of luck to you. I hope it lands on the New York Times bestseller list. But more importantly, I just hope you have fun with it and that mm -hmm. it, it is everything that you want it to be. So thanks again. Thank you. Everybody, thank you. This has been an insightful and, uh, you know, different conversation, which I love. You know, I love me some good conversations. I hope everyone is well. And until the next time we speak again or listen again, may the road before you always be free of snow. How's that one for this week? All right, everybody. Yeah. Talk to you later. As the saying goes, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. And that's a wrap for this week's episode. A big thanks to my guests for sharing their story and to you for listening. Don't forget to share the show with your friends and spread the words. And if you'd like to be a guest on the show, the link is in the show notes. Till next time. Cheers. Cheers.